Yeah. We back out here, boys. The Jamez Report. It's the Jamez Report, I said. Y'all better get ready. Y'all better get ready. We're back and at it again. How y'all doing? It's your boy Jamez. I'm back at it once again, ladies and gentlemen. I know, I know I've been gone for a long, long, long time, but I'm back now. Last night on Monday Night Raw, your boy was able to get on to the Thunderdome. Your boy ain't stopped watching wrestling. Circumstances have kept me out the game a little bit. But I'm back at it. We're back out here live. We ain't going nowhere. I'm going to tell you right now, Monday Night Raw was not the best Monday Night Raw we've ever seen. But tonight we're going to be covering Nia Jackson at Lana Rivalry. We're going to be covering the Raw Men Survivor Series team, the Hunt Business. There was a title change last night on Monday Night Raw. We're going to be covering Drew McIntyre, The Fiend, and Randy Orton. That and a little bit more here on the Jamez Report. Now, how's everybody doing this fine, fine day? How many of you tuned in to Monday Night Raw last night? And how many of you were digging this fly fedora hat? Now that all being said, today you already heard what I'm about to cover. Last night, Monday Night Raw was okay. Would I say it was great? No. Would I say it was subpar? Probably. It wasn't a great Monday Night Raw. Creatively, I don't think they... Covered the women's Survivor Series team very well. To be quite honest and quite frank with you on that. I also don't think they are doing Lana much justice. And I'll explain that here after a bit. Might as well get right into it actually right now anyway. The Raw Women's t Tag Team uh, Survivor Series team is very confusing, especially the storyline they're going to go down. Anybody who's watched WWE for many years has figured out that on every Survivor Series team, there's always some form of self-destructive drama that's going to plague both teams, but one more than the other at Survivor Series. This year, NXT is not going to be involved. This year, NXT is going to be its own thing because of NXT TakeOver. And also because Vince McMahon wants to keep wrestlers as separate as they possibly can to try to stop the spread of COVID. I want to see NXT back next year for Survivor Series. I would love that. I loved having that third brand in there, especially NXT. Uh, having them young, up-and-coming stores try to prove themselves against the already main roster talent. Heck, it made Keith Lee a store, did it not? Now, Nia Jax, St. Baszler versus Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke for the Women's Tag Team Championships. Has a nice ring to it. It gets you in. But I wasn't feeling the match only because you knew one of these teams had to lose. And Lana would come out at the start of the match. And you knew eventually she was going to get involved. And you pretty much figured she's going to get put through a table if or when. Or even if she didn't get involved with that matter. Because it seems like putting Lana through a table is a trending thing nowadays. So if you all see Lana out and about on the streets, just pick her up, put her through a table. Uh, it's a thing to do nowadays. Lana would get in the mat, involved in the match trying to cost Nia Jax and Baszler the Women's Tag Team Championships. But Baszler would get booked. In her famous finishing move. And tap her out. I want to say this. Right now. Mandy Rose. Dana Brooke were undefeated. Since becoming a tag team and going to Raw. They brung it up last week. When they, won, when they were saying who should be. The team captains of this team. Why. Would you put them in a situation to lose. That could have been something you could have built on. After Survivor Series. They haven't lost a match. They haven't got pinned. They haven't tapped out. Let that be a reason to build up for the next pay-per-view coming up after Survivor Series to have Nia Jackson Baszler defend against Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose because they haven't beat beaten either neither team has beaten each other, as far as I know. I think actually I do think Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke did beat Baszler and Nia Jax once. Um 
to be quite honest, or, and, or it, maybe it was the uh, Fatal 4-Way tag team match, I think that is when that happened. But anyway, Jax would later on challenge Lana to a one-on-one -on -one match saying, you know what, I'm going to end her career. This match was not all that great. It wasn't much to tell. Lana got put through a table, though. Uh, big surprise there, right? So, like I said, it's a trendy thing. Now, WWE, I know what they're trying to do with Lana. They're wanting to give her the baby face push, that baby face sympathy, that baby face backing. But I don't think, I, to me, it's not working. I don't know about everybody else who's watching this or who's been watching Raw. It has become kind of like a joke among the fans. I've seen it in comments and things like that. I don't think it's working. And I hope WWE gets away from that. And I know they're trying to build her as a baby face. And I know they're trying to build some, some tension. They're on Monday Night Raw's women's team. And it's obvious that Lana is the weakest link on this team. So look for her to get put through a table by Nia Jax and be eliminated. That's my prediction going into Survivor Series. On to the hunt business. Now this is something that I think WWE is handling, is handling correctly. I know people compare them to the Nation of Domination, a modern day version of the Nation of Domination. I don't think that's the case. I know predominantly, yes, the nation of domination was uh, African-American people with the heritage standing up against, uh, I, don't, I don't know the words to say, racial injustice. That was the motto. And, but they're not coming out, her business is not coming out and doing racial injustice. It may be a form of that in a symbiotic uh, atmosphere in WWE's modern day of pushing it, but... I look at it as a way to you get MVP, who has who is one of the greatest mouthpieces in the WWE. You get Bobby Lashley, who wasn't being used correctly until he joined the hunt business. Um, you look at what they was able to do in TNA Impact, and when I say they, I mean MVP and Bobby Lashley. They dominated. They had real good chemistry together, working together as a team, as an alliance. They're doing the same thing here. MVP does the talking. Bobby Lashley doesn't talk too much. MVP does the talking for the group. He's even came out and said that, look, you know, his his final days is there. He's not wanting to wrestle. As a matter of fact, before the pandemic hit, he was done wrestling pretty much all altogether. His last match was supposed to be against uh, uh, Rey Mysterio for his son. He was doing it for his son, but he wanted to be an executive backstage. He would use the VIP lounge. He would have some segments, and he would be used to an extent, but he did not imagine he was going to be used to the extent that which he's been put in. And you know what? That's one thing I can say about COVID. Thank God for COVID because I've always been a fan, myself personally, of MVP. I've always been a fan. Back when he was in the company for the first time. The Bowling! You know, he was one of the he was one of the greatest United States champions of all time. You can't take that away from that man. So you put him in with Lashley, and Lashley dominates. Now you add Shelton Benjamin, who I don't really need to speak for Shelton Benjamin. Anyone who's been watching Shelton Benjamin in the WWE, outside the WWE, knows the talent of this man. Knows what he's accomplished. Knows what he can do. You put Cedric Alexander with him, who a lot of fans wanted to see get the push. Obviously, yes, I think Alexander is the weaker one out of out of the group, but that's just my opinion on that. But look what they've been able to do. You have a United States champion in Bobby Lashley. You now have a contenders match coming with the Hunt Business, Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander versus the New Day. You have MVP putting on stellar performances uh, as a mouthpiece as doing the talking, as keeping people involved in what they are doing. Last night, all truth would come out. And you know, if all truth is involved, it's going to be something entertaining anyway. Uh, he come out and he plays dumb and he finds out that he's going against Bobby Lashley. And he thought, no, I thought I was coming out here to see Bobby Boucher, my favorite water boy. Who's going to sign my water bottle? Needless to say... You know, World Truth lays down and says, look, it's not necessary, Bob. This ain't necessary, Bobby. Just pin me. We don't need to get him with both champions. And Bobby Lashley would put him in the full Nelson, tap him out, and then Drew Gulak would come out wanting to get that 24-7 championship now that the match was over. Anyone that knows that if the 24-7 champion is in a match that the rules of the 24-7 disappear until after the match and then they are reinstated. 
So Gulak, Gulak comes out to pin the unconscious old truth, but finds himself in the full Nelson from Bobby Lashley. He would then be knocked unconscious as well, but Lashley would go ahead and throw him back down on our truth. One, two, three, you have a new champion in Gulag. And I'd like to point out that Bobby Lashley teased that he was going to pin Gulag to win the 24-7 championship as well. But he ended up not doing that. Later on in the night, after a compelling and entertaining back and forth between the Hunt Business and the New Day, the New Day would go out and yeah, would face Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin. Not for the Raw Tag Team Champions. It was not The championships were not on the line. It was a very entertaining, very good, uh, very well-balanced match. And when I say I really like what they're doing with the Hunt business, by the way, is that they're not making them look weak. They went up against Retribution, which, by the way, in my honest and professional uh, opinion as a as Jamez, Retribution needs to go to SmackDown. They have two big groups on the same brand, even though it was a three-hour show. One's going to look weaker than the other. And I think they did that because Retribution was unable and unsuccessful against the Hunt business. That rivalry is now dead. Why not move Retribution over the SmackDown? Let them raise chaos over there. Because Ali even came out and said that he was the SmackDown hacker. So... There's your storyline. Put him over there on SmackDown. Let him feed off that. Let them have a dangerous group there on SmackDown Live. I don't know why Raw needed, thought that it would be a good idea. Or I say Raw, Vince McMahon, whoever made that decision to keep both the Hunt Business and Retribution on Raw. Because Retribution has a lot of potential. But I digress. The Hunt Business would go on to beat the New Day. Cleanly, I might add. Cleanly. They didn't cheat to win. MVP didn't get involved. It was Bobby Lashley didn't come down and distract nobody. It was a clean victory. I look for the Hunt Business to be Raw Tag Team Champions here very soon. I think they've earned it. I think they deserve it. Uh, I think they carry the show on a lot of nights. Uh, when Raw was not the greatest, at least the Hunt business has been very consistent on that. Moving on, speaking of tag teams and things about Raw, the Raw Men's Survivor Series drama. Now, this was an example of how they should do it for the women. They handled this pretty well on getting drama between this team, and I'm going to explain this to you. AJ Styles, Sheamus, and Keith Lee at the moment is what makes up the Raw uh, Survivor Series team with two spots available. AJ proclaims himself as Captain Styles, as he might add. Sheamus, Keith Lee disagree, of course, about who should be the captain of the team. Raw, Braun Strowman's music hits. Out comes Braun Strowman. I love his. I love what the direction they're kind of going with Strowman. He is a heel. He kind of has this, I'm just here to fight. He even states later on, in this segment that they don't pay me to talk. Because Strowman comes out and tells you why he should be on Team Raw after Keith Lee goes, we all had to qualify. What makes you think that you can just come out here and be on the team? Braun's been on every winning Survivor Series team thus far. Braun has had the most eliminations in a Survivor Series match thus far. That's what qualifies him. Adam Pierce would come out then. He's the bald guy that walks around in a suit, for those of you who don't know, who really, no one really knows why or what he really represents other than he is on both shows. So he's kind of like the authoritative figure for both shows. Um, he is a wrestler, of course, and he does work at the Performance Center helping develop people. I did do my research people on him a little bit, but he came out and said, you know, Braun, you do need to qualify, but heck, I can't find you a qualifying match. And AJ steps up and goes, why don't we just have a triple threat match then? Since Keith Lee and Sheamus both think they can take on Braun Strowman, why not have a triple threat match? And if Braun Strowman can get the win, he'll be on Team Raw, which we knew where this was going, but it builds that drama. Because Keith Lee would have faced Braun Strowman two weeks ago and would get low blowed and lose his match to Braun Strowman. Then he would then return the favor and kick Braun Strowman uh, in, the, in the nuts as well after the match was over. 
So they have this match, and it was a very good match. And it's one of those matches where I wish they would have had a live crowd there. Because there wasn't a bunch of ooh and ahs and flips and, and all this stuff. Keith Lee about broke his neck on a flip when he got caught on the rope when he went to go over the ropes. And thank God he's okay. But it was just big men going at it. Sheamus could do a little bit more of the lighter stuff because he was the lighter of the big men. But with Braun Strowman and Keith Lee, which that is already a rivalry in the making, folks. So there's your drama. Now you add Sheamus into the mix because Sheamus is a fighter. You got AJ Styles. It gives him something to do because he don't have, he, since he's been on Raw, he really had, had nothing to do. Really, to be quite honest. He's got this big bodyguard with him who is Gigantulet or Gigantulet. I, you know, I, I murdered that and I'm sorry, everybody. But And I really hope it don't turn out to be like this big, uh, oh, what's his name? Kali, the great Kali, where he's big, but he can't move. And I'm afraid that's what we're getting with uh, old Kali. By the way, the hat and the red solo cup with the Star Wars blanket behind it. Ain't that just a combination with the Stone Cold Steve Boston shirt on? Hmm. Dripping. Not really. <clears throat> so this was a so this match was very good. And yes, Braun Strowman would go on to win this match by pinning Sheamus, and that was a smart move for storytelling to let him pin Sheamus. Sheamus, and ain't gonna hurt Sheamus' momentum to lose to Braun Strowman. Sheamus has been in the business long enough where him losing to certain matches is not gonna hurt him. Now, Keith Lee would have been the one to get pinned. That would have hurt Keith Lee. Then AJ would try to make peace among everybody. Keith Lee, Braun Strowman, managed to shake hands because they're coming together as a team. AJ celebrates. Sheamus, who got pinned by Braun Strowman, would not shake Braun Strowman's hand. Finally, he would give him a big Irish hug and then bro kick him out the ring. Keith Lee would then run and do his Superman push, whatever you want to call it. Sheamus out the ring, AJ Styles would get upset and drop kick Keith Lee outside the ring. So there's your drama. It's not coherent, but it flowed very nicely in the women's match. And I, I implore you to still go back and watch it, uh, the tag team match. When they're trying to build that drama, it was just done very sloppily. This was done very smooth. It was it was a nice build. It was very it was just very well handled. Uh these men are professionals, these men. They know what they're doing. Maybe it's just the greenness of Lana, the greenness of Mandy Rose, the greenness of of Dana Brooke. And I shouldn't say greenness of Dana Brooke. She's been in WWE for years now, but they're not used to. But she's not used to being used in the capacity of what she's being used in now. Uh, except for last year's Women's Money in the Bank, she does. Dana Brooke does seem to come around during these events. So I'm very interested to see what's going to happen with the Raw Survivor Series team. We would have a return of an old classic match. A guitar on a pole match. I was not excited about this match. It was the second match of the night. And I'm gonna and it has nothing to do with the, 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 the participants. Jeff Hardy is Jeff Hardy. He's a Hall of Famer. Elias could be a future Hall of Famer. He has a lot of uh, pluses about him. He's good on the mic. He... Now, his in-ring performance kind of goes on based on who he's wrestling. If he's wrestling the likes of John Cena, his matches are going to be great. If he's wrestling the likes of Jeff Hardy, they're going to be good. He kind of goes to the level of where he's pushed. He's not going to set the ball himself. He's just going to kind of follow along. The, the only way to win this match, what it was explained to me was, is you climb up, you grab the guitar off the pole, and then you smash it over your opponent, and that's the win. What ended up happening was, was not was that, but a little extra. The thing I don't like about anything on a pole match, regardless of what it is, is you can only do so much uh, storytelling, you're going to do so much in the ring, and then somebody has to go for the pole. Somebody has to. You have to constantly be going for the pole. It gets a little mundane. It's been done before. I'm not that excited about it. Maybe I've seen some people love it. And if you love it, that's great. I'm not dissing anybody or bit or tearing anybody down. If you like the match or you love the match, I don't care. For me personally, I didn't think it was all that great. For me personally, I wasn't as invested in this match. Hardy would go on to win this match. He grabs the controller, smashes it over Elias, but then he has to get the pin for one, two, three to win the match. So right there. There was just a little confusion. I don't know why they did that. 
Now, Monday night would open up with a bang, and Monday night would close with a good bang. Randy Orton opens up Monday Night Raw saying he is the best, period. He's, he didn't just say, I'm the best. He didn't say, I'm one of the bests. I'm the best right now. He said, no, I am the best, and he even added, period. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a statement. That he is no longer the legend killer, but is now simply a legend. Talking about his 14th WWE World Heavyweight title championship reign. He has killed the legend killer. He says, I am no longer the legend killer. I am no longer that guy. I am now simply a legend myself. Orton's been great these during this pandemic. Orton has found this fire, and it started back when Edge came back into the WWE where he found this fire, this desire to move on, to fight, to give these fiery promos. And you've seen it with the Drew McIntyre rivalry. He has got it down, folks. He knows what he's doing. He's a veteran. He's a veteran in the locker room. He's matured from where he once was. And he, if you watch the untold... After Hell in a Cell, where he talks about The Undertaker, and if you haven't, please go watch that. And he even comes out and apologizes to those that he's done wrong because of his attitude back in the day. Nonetheless, he threatens The Fiend and calls out any WWE superstar, Drew McIntyre included, to come take his title. He dares you. The Alexa Bliss would answer the call. Those of you who may not know, or those of you who have not been paying that close attention, Alexa Bliss and The Fiend have this, I want to say relationship, but a friendship going. I didn't think I'd like it at first, but I love what they're doing with Alexa Bliss. She was the perfect choice to feed off of Bray Wyatt. She was the perfect choice to bounce off of Bray Wyatt. And to give this Fiend a different outlook, a different character, I believe The Fiend is still a heel. But he's moving towards the face direction with Alexa Bliss's help. I love Alexa Bliss and this uh, crazy cuckoo uh, side of her, to say the least. So she comes out and she just stands there, smiling and laughing. On her gloves, she shows play and pain. Play and pain. She takes away the play and gets real serious. The Fiend's music hits after she says, he's, he's ever here. He could be here now. I think were the words. Randy Orton's scared of the fiend. And he shows it on his face. See, it's the little things like that that tell a story. It's the little expressions on the face of a wrestler that gives it away. The annex, the addicts, um, the, the way they respond to things. The facial expressions, what sells and what don't sell. I'm not going to get in, into all that. But that's something that a lot of young guys, especially in the WWE, they need to learn how to sell fear. They need to learn how to sell uh Oh my gosh, I, I don't I don't want to face this guy. He would then be hit by a claymore once the lights came up because the fiend never came out. He would then be hit with a claymore, knocked unconscious, Drew McIntyre, fired up as always. He wants his baby back. He wants his title back. And Big Daddy Claymore is going to win it back for him. So he thinks he leaves the ring. The Miz comes out of the audience area. Goes to cash in money in a bank on an un unconscious Orton. Mind you, Orton lost to The Miz when Miz cashed in the money in the bank for the first time. So it's that history there. Drew McIntyre would interrupt before the bell would even ring. So the money in the bank never got cashed in. Destroying both Miz, both Morrison. And saying, if anyone's going to take this championship away from Orton, it's going to be me. Let me tell you something. I love Randy Orton. I love Drew McIntyre. I am, but I am so, I'm getting to the point where I'm tired of seeing them being rivals. It's time for them both to move on, and maybe that's why The Fiend is involved. I think The Fiend is going to face Drew McIntyre before he ever gets to Randy Orton, because McIntyre is not going to let The Fiend take that title off Orton. So I see that coming to fruition to prolong Randy Orton's title championship reign. Orton would then say that how he was going to backstage, that he is going to remind 
everyone that he is the apex predator. He's going to remind Drew McIntyre of the RKO. Miz and Morrison, fiery and irate as they should be, challenge Drew McIntyre to a two-on-one handicap match. Seen this coming. I knew it was going to come. It was, it was the main event of Monday Night Raw, and it was a very exciting, very well uh, thought out match. Obviously, The Miz is not on the levels uh, that he once was. Obviously, The Miz is not where he once was at in the WWE brand. I do think him being with Morrison kind of takes him back to where he was when he first began this childish, kind of goofy, you kind of can't hate him type of heel. But you can see it now that he's got the money in the bank title. He is doing more of that. He is being more abrasive. He's being more insulting. He is being more fiery in his promos. He's kind of getting that back. John Morrison's still keeping it light by saying facts, facts, facts last night or doing whatever antics he's doing. The Miz, I hope, does become WWE champion again someday because of all the WWE superstars on the roster right now, he deserves it. But he would go on and get beat by Drew McIntyre last night. Then Drew McIntyre would be hit by Randy Orton with an RKO out of nowhere. The close of the show is exactly how it opened up with Randy Orton standing in the ring with the Fiend's music and the Fiend and Bray Wyatt laughing. <laughs> Orton, ladies and gentlemen, is scared, as he should be. Orton doesn't know what to do, as he shouldn't know what to do. But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back. I'm glad to be back. I hope you enjoyed the show today. I hope you enjoyed what the content I brought to you. Hit the like. Hit the share. Hit the follow. Hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on a Jamez report. If you have your comments, put them in the comments below. Let's have a conversation about WWE and the direction it's heading in the Survivor Series. Did you agree with the things that I said? Do you have better suggestions? Let me know in the comments below. Let's have that conversation. Let's have that interacting. And most importantly, everybody, have a great and fantastic rest of your day and week. I will be back with you to talk about AEW this week or NXT, depending on which one I decide to watch. Until then, have a great and fantastic day and week, ladies and gentlemen.